All right, welcome to Artificial Intelligence Office Hours. This is going to be the fourth and final time that I'm going to try this today. I'm sitting in my basement here with my virtual library, whiteboard, computer, Wirecast, LinkedIn, slides, trying to figure this all out. So I appreciate your patience as I try to do this. I'm a one-man broadcasting team. I kind of am thinking about those one-man bands you used to see with the drummer and the cymbal and playing the saxophone all at the same time. I kind of feel a little bit like that. But this is the first office hours I'm going to do, and hopefully this will be a regular season where we can answer questions, uh, where we can give some uh, information to you about the topic of how artificial intelligence is being used in our lives. And I thought it would be best to start out today to talk about how artificial intelligence is being used to deal with the current pandemic that our entire planet is dealing with at this time. So what I wanted to do was to mention first off that when we talk about AI, or you see it in a newspaper article, what you need to remember is that AI um, is a big field. But what most people are talking about is a narrow form of it called machine learning. Now, what is machine learning? Well, it's basically where we give the computer a set of tools that it can use to recognize different patterns. And then from those patterns, be able to predict future events, future behavior, or to identify things in the future. Simple case, let's say I want an AI to identify the difference between a cat and a dog. I don't have to program in what a cat looks like and what a dog looks like. I simply give it lots of training data about cats and dogs. So let's take a little bit of a look at how machine learning, or what the press calls AI, is being used to deal with this current pandemic. So you may have seen a couple different articles about how a large supercomputer uh, that was commissioned by the U.S. Department of Energy is being used to try to figure out what the proteins on this virus look like. Because scientists have been able to very quickly figure out uh, what the virus uh, would generate as far as proteins go, looking at the RNA and DNA, and then uh, once that protein is produced, one of the big questions as far as how it interacts with the cells, how it interacts with other chemistry around it, is how it folds. And predicting that can be fairly difficult, and it can be pre uh, actually figuring that out can be fairly difficult to do through direct observation, um, at least without a lot more uh, tests and time. So what they're doing is they're actually feeding data about how other proteins have folded, how these um, bonds interact, feeding that into this large supercomputer, and it's actually trying to calculate what is the most likely scenario for how this is folded out. So it's looking uh, lots and lots of different uh, possibilities and then trying to figure out through running different simulations what is going to be most likely. So there's been a couple different articles about that, but there's one thing that's really cool. There is a project called Folding at Home. So instead of having a supercomputer located in one place, the idea is to have this distributed computing capability where you might lend a little bit of your idle processing time. Those of you that have PC games, uh, you have uh, maybe big graphics cards that have these big GPUs on them. You can actually lend that processing power two different scientific projects when you're not gaming. And so this is called Folding at Home. It's one of several different um, what they call bionic projects. It's run by the uh, um, uh, University of Berkeley. And they have several different projects, but this one's called Folding at Home. And you can actually um, download this software, which is foldingathome.org, and you can uh, participate in this. So right now they're having so many people jump online and saying that they're willing to participate to lend their idle time to this project. They're actually having to kind of rejigger things and figure out how to break up the data a little bit more efficiently. Another uh, thing that you may have seen is about how epidemiologists are actually using AI to predict 
the movement of the disease. And this was an algorithm that um, turns out was very effective in actually predicting, uh, it had a model that predicted very well the spread of this virus based on people's movements uh, through uh, planes and trains and other things like that. So very um, interesting, especially for any future pandemics we might be facing. In China, there's a number of ways that they're using AI. One is not only the virus research, which we talked about before, but also being able to detect who might have that particular virus based on heat scans. So there may be other reasons why you may be a, a little bit hot. Maybe you're flush, maybe you've been running, uh, but how can we detect a heat signature that can be identified with this virus? So actually trying to massively screen people using cameras. Also automated, um, Diagnostics related to uh, scans such as CT and MRI and traditional x-ray uh, scans, being able to predict then does this person have this virus or are they getting a secondary infection related to the virus. And then finally actually using autonomous vehicles. There's not many vehicles out on the road right now. Might be a great time to try out your automated vehicle to actually get medical supplies from one place to another. The White House has actually asked for um, help uh, from AI specialists. So there's a um, place called Kaggle that Google sponsors, I believe, and they have uh, provided this data set for AI experts to analyze. And it was actually a fairly complex um, system. They had the National Library of Medicine involved, uh, Georgetown's University for Security and Emerging Technology. There was also the Allen AI Institute was involved to basically get all the scientific papers, the scientific research into a machine readable format that then AI might be able to predict uh, based on other um, uh, uh, viruses that are very similar, how this might uh, play out. And then finally, the last one I mentioned, wanted to mention here is uh, about how social media is now having to turn to automated means of content moderation. So there's already some of that, but they've had to massively deploy that because now they just are not in the same place. They're having to disperse. Uh, as Facebook said yesterday, they're just trying to keep the lights on. So uh, it's very difficult for them to be able to scale up their servers and their network infrastructure. Uh, and so those people are kind of being tasked with that job that might be helping with moderation. So instead they're deploying this. It's probably going to lead to an over-moderation, especially in places like YouTube. People's videos are going to be taken down when they probably shouldn't be because uh, the moderation policies will probably be too strict by this AI. But it'll be uh, fine-tuned as things go along. So very good. So thanks for watching. It looks like we may have gotten almost all the way through this without any major errors. And so I'm going to go to LinkedIn and I'm going to see if we actually have any questions that have come in because 